Okay, so, big crowd, welcome. The aim of this talk is, is really to kind of, um, it's really to help you guys join the dots with what's actually going on um, out in the, in the kind of the bigger workplace and to understand sort of some of the key um, uh, decisions that are going on and to be able to sort of work through some of the phenomena that you see uh, going on in the global markets. Um, just to introduce myself before we start, uh, my name is Ted Wayman. Uh, my background is I'm an accountant. I started with Ernst & Young, don't get me wrong, I enjoyed my time there, particularly the exams. In fact, I enjoy the exams so much, I sat with them twice, some them three times. Anyway, after six years as an accountant, I found that life was too exciting. It's all late night, fast women, fast cars, cocaine, so I had to downshift my life. So I left and I joined JP Morgan, a small bank some of you will have heard of. I did another six years at JP Morgan. I did an MBA, worked on the investment management side. I did an MBA there, stands for more bloody accountants, and finally escaped more than anything else in about 2003. So since 2003, I've been designing, developing, and delivering training workshops um, for clients around the world. So my speciality is what I call commercial finance, helping companies understand how their finance uh, and the, how they're financed, how they're structured, and some of the challenges uh, from finance actually in the, kind of, in, in the commercial marketplace rather than technical finance and stuff, how you account for something. I've worked with over 200 companies around the world, and I've worked in 32 different countries, so mainly uh, uh, Europe, uh, Middle East, a little bit in Africa, a little bit in Asia, um, none of the Americas there. So some interesting places up there, uh, places such as um, Palestine, for example, Iran, um, Ghana, etc., etc., etc. Uh, and I've written a book, so you've got my book there. Um, so I uh, uh, wrote a book uh, a couple of years ago. Um, uh, you guys um, actually emailed me out of the blue and said, will you write a book? You know when they say everyone's got a book in them? I haven't. Um, <laughs> but when I had a publisher phone me up and say, will you write a book? And I have so many friends who've written books and can't find publishers, I thought, you've actually got to do this. So I kind of took a punch and, um, and I think it was a pretty successful book, actually. I had one chap who gave me a piece of work on the back of it who said that it was so exciting he took it on holiday and he couldn't put it down. I thought that was... He must have got somebody else's book. Anyway, so um, today we're going to talk about um, you know the, the kind of the, the, what's going on in the in the global economy. Um, and I'm going to start off with a quote from a, a chap called Benjamin Franklin, who you will find on a hundred dollar bill, and he said that the miseries of mankind are brought upon them by the false estimates they have made of the value of things. The miseries of mankind brought upon them by the false estimates they made with the value of things. Now I'm not going to guarantee I can tell you exactly what things are worth, but I'm reminded of my wife by that quote. My wife used to work for a lady called Anya Heinmarch. Has anybody here ever heard of Anya Heinmarch? She is a body shop. Not the body shop. No, those two words you will find strike fear into every man's heart because Anya Heinmarch makes handbags and her handbags retail for about £2,000 each. Why anyone would spend £2,000 on a handbag when you can nip into Sainsbury's, speak to the chaps in behind the checkout nicely enough, they'll give you a plastic bag for 5p, which fulfills pretty much the same function. But maybe that's my lack of grasp of finance, rather than my lack of grasp of, uh, lack of, grasp of fashion, rather than my lack of grasp of finance. Um, I've also put Wonga up there. Uh, you, most of you have heard of Wonga. A little interesting fact about Wonga, if you were to borrow $100 from Wonga and pay nothing for 10 years, you would end up owing more than the United States of America. Just out of interest, how much does the United States owe? Trillions. Trillions, you're right, it is trillions. It's 19 trillion to be precise. In fact, last time I looked at it, it was 19.6 trillion dollars, so we're very nearly at 20 trillion. A figure so large that if you were to repay the debt of the United States at the rate of one dollar per second, it would take you more than 500,000 years. Obviously that's an academic number because it's increasing at a rate of greater than one dollar per second, so if you were to repay it at one dollar per second, you would never repay it. In fact, if you were to pay, uh, borrow 100 euro, uh, dollars from uh, Wonga and pay nothing for 10 years, you would end up owing uh, about 115 quadrillion dollars. That's a thousand, a thousand trillion, a million billion. It's a very big number. The moral of the story is, okay, borrow. don't borrow money from one exactly. <laughs> so here is their website. It's a little bit out of date, um, but you'll notice on there it says representative 5,853% APR, which is almost immoral. And what's interesting about that is that people's lack of grasp of understanding of basic finance causes a lot of the problems that we end up with in the world. So, trillions, billions, thousands and millions, we need to understand what we're actually talking about here. So let's work out what money actually is. So I've got here 
One of these. Can anybody tell me what that is worth? One dollar. <laughs> okay, we well, say it's one dollar. Yeah. But only because you think it's a dollar. Okay, this is actually a piece of paper. It's not even a piece of paper, it's a piece of cotton. It has no value. It only has value because you believe it has value. Now, if you go back to the good old days, before money, you'll find yourself in the barter economy. And the barter economy is where I'm walking down the street and I've got a chicken under my arm, and I bump into one of you and you've got a lamb under your arm and you want chicken tonight and I want lamb tonight. Okay, and this works. As long as you've got what I want, it's exactly the same time as I have what you want. When you look around this room, nothing in here would be here if we lived in a barter economy. It just, it, it just it's impossible. And so what we need in order for, our, in order for our, our economy to work, we need some form of currency. We need a means of exchange that allows us to buy and sell goods and services. And I've decided we're going to use tomatoes in our economy. Now, if you're sitting there thinking, I'm not sure I'd like uh, uh, to use tomatoes, or I don't think they make a very good currency, you'd be right. What is it about tomatoes that make them unsuitable to be used as a currency, as a means of exchange in our society? They're perishable, okay? So we need something that's going to actually restore wealth. Because if you're saving up for your summer holiday next year, you're putting tomatoes in a basket under your bed, when it comes to the summer holiday, you'll have a, a rather rotten, soggy mass. So we need something that's going to actually restore wealth. What else? Take long to produce. Sorry? It take a long time to produce. They take a long time to produce. Well, actually, yeah. the fact that you can't produce them at all is a problem. Because if you want to pay rice, just go and grow some more tomatoes. So you can you can create them and you can destroy them. Anything else? Demand. Not everyone might want tomatoes. Not everyone might want tomatoes. Well, yeah, but don't forget this is a currency, so we're not buying we're not wanting them for uh, them as tomatoes. We're wanting them because we can buy something else with them. But then you start to think about well, I like to use tomatoes for you know my salad, for example. So uh, we need something which doesn't have an application for anything else, it's effectively industrially useless. And finally, we need something which is homogeneous. You can have big tomatoes, small tomatoes, ripe tomatoes, unripe tomatoes. And if you cut tomato in half, buy something with half a tomato, the other half you put in your pocket and your trousers go soggy. So we need something which cannot be created, cannot be destroyed. We need something which is industrially useless, which is homogeneous and divisible, and something which will act as a store of wealth. So if tomatoes are no good, what shall we use? What will fulfill those four criteria? So is that the gold? Thank you very much. Gold, absolutely. So we're, using, we're going to use gold instead. Instead, gold cannot be created, cannot be destroyed, despite what you read in the alchemist. It is industrially useless. Yes, I know you can use it in your mobile phones these days and for electronics, but industrial demand does not affect the price of gold. It's homogeneous. It's divisible. You can have gold bars, gold coins, gold dust. And it acts as a store of wealth. That gold bar you put under your bed is the same gold bar in a day, a week, a month, a year, in a thousand years. So gold becomes actually a pretty good means of exchange, a pretty good currency. And the problem is it's not very practical because if you want to buy a coffee from Starbucks, you need to go and you need to first of all make sure that they've got very accurate um, scales. And as you weigh out your gold dust, you find somebody behind you sneezes, the gold dust goes over everybody, um, and uh, you, you know, it, you, you've lost your money. And if you want to buy a second-hand car, what's your name? Voitech. Voitech. So if I want to buy a second-hand car from Voitech, I'm not sure I do want to buy a second-hand car, but if I want to buy a second-hand car from Voitech, I'm going to need two gold bars. And if I put two gold bars in my pockets, my trousers will fall down because they're quite heavy. So I need somebody to look after them for me. What's your name? Bryony. So Bryony is going to look after my gold bars. So I take my two gold bars to Bryony, I give them to Bryony, and Bryony gives me two pieces of paper that says, I owe Ted two gold bars. Now, when I want to buy my car, I come and see Bryony, I say, you've got two gold bars of mine, I give her the pieces of paper, she gives me gold bars, I go and see Voitech and I say, here are my gold bars, can I have your car? What does Voitech do with his gold bars? Sure. Gives them to Bryony, he gets the pieces of paper. This is a long-winded process for me to end up with a, with a car and you to end up with, a, with a, uh, pieces of paper. So what we see here is the, ba the birth of paper currency, paper currency backed by gold. Okay, so at any point, we can go and see Brani and say, you owe me a bar of gold, but we don't have to because we don't need the gold because it's impractical, because gold dust gets blown away and the gold bars are too heavy. So we just use these pieces of paper, and our pieces of paper around our economy are, are now used uh, in, in order to trade for goods and services. And this is all well and good for everybody, apart from Brani, because Brani 
social person who used to enjoy having a little chat with people, and people come into her gold shop, etc. Et 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 and now nobody comes to visit her. In fact, nobody knows even where her shop is anymore because it's been so long. So she says, I'm going to try an experiment. She's got two gold bars in front of her, and she takes one off the table. So now we have two pieces of paper, each backed by a gold bar, but there's only one gold bar sitting in Briony's shop. What happens to my economy? Nothing, absolutely nothing, because nobody's gone to see Bryony, so nobody actually knows that there's no gold bars on the table. And in 1971, Nixon tried the ultimate experiment, and he took the second gold bar off the table. And so effectively, what we now have is what's known as a fiat currency, literally fiat from the Latin, let it be done. Nothing to do with the car company, but I've got the picture anyway. So the fiat currency, this is a fiat currency. This is a dollar and is backed by nothing. It is backed by the promise of the United States of America. If you trust the government, then this has value. And if you lose trust in the government, it has no value. Now this is quite an interesting concept when you think about it, because if you travel to Europe on your holidays, you may end up using one of these. Can anybody tell me what these are? Yeah. Five euros, to be precise, but yes, you're right, they are euros, they are five euro notes. What's the difference? Between them? Yeah, what's the difference between them? Uh, the number? <laughs> yeah, so it says five on it. Uh, the, the number on it, so you mark it, it's an original five. Okay, so they've both, they're both got serial numbers. Serial numbers. Yeah. But the serial numbers are different. Though. The serial numbers are different. So does that make it, which one would you rather have? Any. Either. They're exchangeable. The one that's got no fake or a real serial number, I guess. They've both got real serial numbers. Yeah. They're both real. They're, neither of them are fake. They're both real. The problem is one has an X and one has a Y. Here's my Y, here's my X. Okay, this is kind of like chromosome tool, okay. back down to the kind of, you know, the birth of Adam and Eve and all that kind of stuff. An X, an X is issued by Germany. So this one is issued by Germany, the German Central Bank. This one, Y, is issued by the Greek Central Bank. And in 2011, there were rumors going around Europe that shops would not accept a euro issued by the Greek Central Bank because of the Greek debt crisis. Now, if you hear these rumours, and they are only rumours, you may not be able to find out whether they're substantiated, but if you hear rumours, if I come to you and I say, you can have an X, which you can definitely exchange for five euros worth of goods and services, or a Y, which you may be able to exchange for goods and services for five euros, which one would you rather have? The X. And so suddenly what we find is through faith, these actually have different values to them in terms of their purchasing. Are there any other European banks that are backing? Oh, every, every, every central bank issues its own. Is, they don't back it, they issue it. Okay. They issue it. But it's the same as like, the Scottish pounds? Absolutely. So the Scottish pound is issued by the Scottish banks. Rather, that's the Scottish bank rather than the central bank. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is, it is you know, so hence the, the comment, you know, I think you'll find that's legal tender when you try and spend it down here with taxi drivers. <laughs> so when we talk about money, if I said, how much money do you have, would you include the, uh, the, the, the notes and coins in your, in your, in your work purse or wallet or handbag? If I said, how much money, exactly how much money do you have? Down to a penny. Yes, yes. you would. Okay. Would you include the money in your current account? Yes. In your deposit account? Yes. Okay. And would you include the car? No, because your car isn't an asset. So when we talk about money, we're talking about not only uh, there's M4, which is the pure cash that you can see on the table there, but M, sorry, M0, M4 is actually not only the cash, it's the money in your deposit account and your current account. And the reason that we use this is because banks can create money. And banks create money through what we call a process of pr fractional reserving. And this is the way fractional reserving works. Up here we've got A, Mr. Adam. Adam has $1,000. How much money in my economy? $1,000, $1,000 in cash. He takes that money, he deposits it in the bank. The bank puts $100 on one side and lends $900 to Brian. Brian buys whatever it is he wants to buy for Ch from Charlie for $900. And what does Charlie do? He takes that $900 and he deposits it in the bank. So how much money is in my economy now? Adam's got $1,000 on deposit in the bank, and Charlie is about to put $900 in, so there's $1,900 in my economy. 
The bank puts $90 on one side and lends the $810 to Dave, who goes and buys something, whatever it is, for $800 from Edward. Edward takes his money and he deposits it in the bank. The bank puts $81 on one side and lends out $729 to Fred, who buys whatever it is from George. So having started with $1,000, after three sessions of this, we now have $3,439 in our economy. And so commercial banks, through this process known as fractional reserving, can create money. The central bank can control this money. Because if they say, rather than putting $100 on one side, you have to put 20%, $200, they actually take money out of the economy, deflation. And by reducing the reserves that banks have to hold, they push money into the economy and they create inflation. But they don't take them out, right? They basically, it's just in case everyone wants to start finally take the money out, right? Is that Not it? everybody can take the money out, so you well, cannot, exactly. that's why it yeah. run on the yeah. bank. So, yeah. so it only works, so this fractional reserving system only works if you believe you can get your money out of the bank. Yeah. If everybody tries to get the money out of the bank, then it falls apart. So in exactly the same way that we use currency, which is purely based on faith, and if you lose faith in your currency, then it has no value. In exactly yeah. the same way that the banking system only works if you maintain faith in the banking system. Okay, as soon as you lose faith in it, it becomes effectively a self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay. And so in terms of our fiat currencies, in a uh, uh, $100 bills, that's what $10,000 looks like. That's what $100,000 looks like. There's a million dollars. There's a billion dollars. And that's a trillion dollars. So when we talk about the debt has $19 trillion, it's 19 of those in $100 bills. It's quite a lot of money. So, commercial banks can create money. Now, have you ever heard of this? Invented in 1907 by Lizzie Phillips. Have you ever played Monopoly? Hey, can, yeah. can you survive the 3S test of Monopoly? I've yet to meet somebody who can, but we will try you guys. Okay. Question number one, have you ever played Monopoly? Yeah. Yes. Question number two, have you ever managed to get to the end of a game of Monopoly? Yeah. Yes. And question number three, have you still been talking to the people you've been playing with? <laughs> exactly. See, they want to work. Monopoly invented really to expose the iniquity of the capitalist system whereby the landlord gains at the expenses of the tenants. It teaches us actually completely the reverse. It says if you want to get rich, you've got to buy a lot of property. If you buy property to get rich. Now, if you next time you're playing Monopoly, see if you can get hold of the rule book. Because it's quite interesting, because the rule book says this, the bank never goes broke. If the bank runs out of money, it may issue as much as is needed by writing on any ordinary paper. What's another word for that? Printing extra money. Printing extra money. What do we call printing money, do you know? Do you know what it's called? It's called quantitative easing. So quantitative easing is printing money. So not only commercial banks can create money through factual reserving, central banks can and have been printing money literally just by running the printing presses. In fact, these days they don't run the printing presses anymore. What they do is that they, they create it electronically. Everyone happy so far? Let's look at how they do that. Okay? This is a bond. A bond is in effect a form of a loan. It's an IOU. So it says, if you own this piece of paper, I will pay you $100,000. That's the nominal or face value. I will pay this to you in 10 years' time. That's known as the, uh, the maturity uh, date. And in the meantime, I will pay you 5% coupon, in other words, for interest, of the nominal or face value. Okay, so if you own this piece of paper, you will receive 5% of £100,000, that's £5,000 a year for 10 years, and in 10 years' time, you will receive £100,000. Okay. This bond is a tradable security. If it's traded in the security, people are buying and selling it in the market every single day. And if they're buying and selling it in the market, the price must fluctuate. Let's look at how the price fluctuates. If you were to pay £100,000 for this bond, and you were to receive £5,000 a year, and then £100,000 back in 10 years' time, that's the equivalent of 5%. Oops, I'm sorry. That's the equivalent of a yield of 5%. OK? 
Okay, so it's a bit like I put my money into the bank, 100,000 into the bank, it pays an interest of 5,000 pounds a year, and in 10 years' time, I take my 100,000 pounds out. But because this is traded, the price can go up and down. So for example, and it doesn't quite work, but it's a close approximation. If you were to pay 50,000 pounds for this bond, and to receive 5,000 pounds a year, and then 100,000 pounds in 10 years' time, you can see the yield actually goes to 10%. It's not quite exactly the same, but it, it's a close approximation for this example. So this is a really important relationship. This is absolutely crucial. Everything hinges on this. As the price of an asset goes down, the yield goes up. Okay. So as the price that you pay for this bond goes down, the yield on the bond goes up. As the price goes up, the yield goes down. The price and the yield of an asset, whether it's a house, a share, a bond, are all inversely related. Okay. But that's, so, can I ask a question? Yeah. But that's only if you're talking about absolute numbers. If you're talking about percentages, it doesn't really matter, right? If, if you always get 5% coupon. You get 5% of 100,000, the nominal yeah. face value. So that does not change. You're getting 5,000 pounds a year for 10 years. Okay. Yeah. So where is the 50,000 from as opposed to 100,000? What you pay, this is this has oh, a market value. Oh, I see. This is traded okay. in the market. Oh, right, 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 so right. this is what you're going to get back in 10 years yeah. time yeah. and drawn into the coupon, but it's nothing to do with the market value. Okay. Okay, the, the market sets the value. The market says I oh, want you might pay more than 100,000, you might pay less than 100,000. If you pay more than 100,000, the yield will come down below 5%. If you pay less than 100,000, I'll give you an example. If this is issued by Germany, the yield is 2% or was 2%. In that case, you would value this, obviously if it's Germany, it'd be in euros, but you would value that at 126,000. Paying $126,000 of pounds for this and getting 5,000 a year and 100,000 in 10 years' time is the equivalent of a 2% yield. If this bond is issued by Greece, you would not pay 126,000. In fact, the market value was 18,000. 18,000 to get 5,000 a year and 100,000 in 10 years' time is the yield of 35%. You demand a 35% yield from Greece because it is higher risk than Germany, in exactly the same way that Wonga demands 5,853% from its uh, customers because they are higher risk than you and I. Well, certainly I, I'm not sure. <laughs> so, very important relationship. As demand for an asset falls, the price... Does it? No, if demand falls, the price goes down, doesn't it? If the price... If demand falls, price goes down. Nobody wants to buy something, the price has to come down. Sorry, Nobody wants to buy your house, you have to drop the price. Yeah, so yeah. the and therefore the yield goes up. If demand goes up, then the price goes up, and therefore the yield goes yeah. down. Okay? So is everyone happy with that, that relationship? Okay, this is absolutely crucial. As demand goes down, the price goes down. As the price goes down, the yield goes up. As demand goes up, the price goes up, and as the price goes up, the yield comes down. So, bear that in mind. Have a look here. This is the yield on 10-year government bonds, UK, US, Germany, and Japan. I want you to look at the red line, which is the US. In here, the US, the yield fell dramatically in late 2008. The yield fell because the price went up. And the price went up because demand went up. Oh, okay. Exactly. So something happened in late 2000 to cause everybody to go ah! and buy US government bonds. What happened specifically? That was a crash. Yeah, exactly what happened on the 15th of oh. September. Who went boom? Lehman. Lehman Brothers. Lehman Brothers went bust. Leaving your money in the bank is no longer safe. So people took their money out of the bank. If you and I take our money out of the bank, we can put it under the bed. But if you're uh, a large organization, like uh, we were looking at Talis yesterday, and they've got 2.5 billion in the bank, mm. you can't put it out under the mattress. They don't make mattresses that big. So you need to put it into something which is safe. And the safest place you can think of is US government bonds. 
So, US, UK, Germany and Japan. Take another look at the US. What is the trend in the yield from 2006 to 2012? Down. It's going down. So the yields are coming down. The yields must be coming down because the price must be going up. Okay, so here is the US bond prices. This is what they've been doing for the last 30 odd years. Prices are going up because demand is going okay. up. Because people are having less and less faith in the banks. Who is the biggest buyer of US government bonds? Name her. Is it a different country? No, it's a person. She is the most powerful yes. woman in the so world. If, if they say it's Merkel, but it isn't. She is unelected, and she dictates every single price in yes. the world. Her name is? It's um, Yellen. Janet Yellen. Janet, 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 Janet Yellen, Yellen is the chair of the Federal Reserve. Before her, it was Ben Bernanke, and before Ben Bernanke, it was Alan Greenspan. Yeah. Alan Greenspan got us into the mess. Ben Bernanke got us out of the mess. And now Janet Yellen has to sort out the getting us out of the mess mess. <laughs> okay. So this is where we are at the moment. Okay, this is uh, May 16th, so uh, uh, just at the, uh, at the summer. And we can see that the yields have been coming down and down and down. And they're sitting around about 1.5 for the US and for the UK, Japan. In fact, we'll talk about this. This is a, this is a bit of an issue. So what was the, what, who's the blue one? Is that uh, Germany? So this blue one, this is Germany, yes. Yeah. And this is Japan down here. Okay. So when you buy an asset, when you buy a house or a bond or a share in a company, you're buying the same fundamentals. Okay. One of the things that you're pricing is risk. So if it's a high risk, I want a high return. And the other thing you're pricing is the cost of money or interest rates. Because my bond example, if you can get 10% in the bank, you won't buy a bond that yields you 10%. Okay, very important relationship here. Okay, so the first thing we priced was risk. Okay, if it, if you are high risk, I want a high return to compensate me for that risk. So that's why Germany borrows money at 2% and Greece at 35%. But also, I'm not going to buy a bond that yields 5% if I can put my money in the bank and get 10% interest. Mm. So if I can get 10% in the bank, I won't buy the bond. But if nobody buys the bond, demand goes down. And as demand goes down, the price goes down. And as the price goes down, the yield goes up. And so the bond falls in price, and therefore you can get 10%. So now we see the relationship between interest rates and asset prices. If you put interest rates up, what happens to asset prices? They go down. They go down. And it's a very, very simple connection if you think about it. If your mortgage went to 20%, you wouldn't be able to afford your house. And nobody would be able to afford houses. And therefore, demand would go right down. And therefore, house prices would have to come down. So if you drop interest rates, asset prices go up. Very, very important relationship there. Bubbles happen when asset prices disconnect from the fundamentals. So if you take, I don't know, a watch like this, as the price of a watch goes up, demand goes down, theoretically, this is the luxury gift, so it doesn't always quite work like that. But in, you know, in a standard, you know, take a spoon, for example, is a spoon. So the price of a spoon goes up, demand goes down. So if I'm selling these at 5p, you can buy lots and lots. And if I'm selling them for £5, you kind of think, I'll go to Ikea and get a 5p spoon. Okay? Bubbles happen when prices disconnect. As the price of your house goes up, demand goes up. Exactly. It actually goes against the grain, doesn't it? Because demand goes up, the price goes up. And as the price goes up, demand goes up, demand goes up, the price goes up, the price goes up, demand goes up. And then we end up in bubble territory, where we've actually disconnected from the fundamentals. Well, but it's only disconnected if your prediction that prices will keep going up is wrong. Because the reason... Well, that's, that, that prediction is based on the same prediction as a chain letter. The chain letter only works if nobody breaks it. Yeah. Somebody has to break it at some point. It has to. And the person who breaks it loses. Mm. Or the person after the person who breaks it. Or the person just before the person who breaks it loses. Okay. So it does it doesn't work. 
Ponzi scheme only only stops working. Yeah. So we talked about the role of interest rates. So summarise: if you buy a building, you are buying you buy bricks and mortar. What you are actually buying is the future income associated with that building, and we price it on yield at a fundamental basis. If you buy a share, yes, is that a share? Yes, if you buy a share in a company, you get part ownership of that company. What you're buying is the future income in terms of dividend and capital growth. But don't forget the capital growth of the company is that only when you sell the share to somebody else, you're selling the future income stream. You're selling the future, the right to all the future dividends. When you buy a bond issued by a company or a government, a bond is, uh, is an IOU. You are buying the interest rates and the capital repayment. Some people choose to invest in fine wine. What income does fine wine give you? Is it a capital appreciation? Yeah, but that's not income, is it? No. So it's a bet. It's a pure, simple mm -hmm. bet. You think the price of that wine will go up because it's scarce. They don't make 67 anymore. And it tastes nicer. If you get it wrong, you end up uh, with a nice bottle of wine to drink, at least. Unless, of course, you get it very wrong, which case you end up with vinegar. Some people choose to invest in art. Mm -hmm. This is Tracy Emmons on May Bed. Does anyone want to guess what that was sold for in 2014? So this is a million, no, like 10 million. 2.4 million pounds. Yeah. My 16 year old daughter has decided that she too is a multi millionaire because yeah. that's the state of her bedroom every morning. Let's look at a proper piece of art. Here's Cezanne's card players. 2011, it was the most expensive painting in the world. Does anyone have, have a guess? Dollars? 200 million? 200 million. 200 million, good, actually good, very good guess. It was 275 million dollars. Since overtaken last year by Gauguin, when will you marry, which was sold for 300 million dollars estimated. Now, I'm sure it's a very nice picture, and I'm a bit of a philistine when it comes to what, but do you really think that the only gets 300 million dollars worth of pleasure from looking at it? There's no yield on there unless you put it in the gallery and charge people to look at it. And you can work out how many people have got to see it, how much they'll pay to get you anywhere close to a yield that you would accept. Which leads us on to gold. What yield do you get from gold? What income do you receive from gold? What income? Do you receive no income. You receive no income. Does it smell nice? Does it taste nice? It looked nice and don't give me that kind of yellow shiny. <laughs> she wanted to say that it's shiny. <laughs> it's shiny. Gold has no value. But gold has no value, which is what makes it so valuable. Because actually, when, when there's times of stress in the economy, that's where people start to buy gold. Okay? But it has no value. It has no intrinsic value. It is only valuable as a means of exchange. So, without gold, we have a fiat currency, and with a fiat currency, it means that uh, governments can print money. So in exactly the same, we've said that Janet Yellen is printing money. Janet Yellen is the biggest owner of US government debt. So the government debt is about 19 trillion, and the US government owns 4.5 trillion pounds of dollars worth. That's about a quarter. And so what happens is that the central bank printing this money and putting the money into the markets, it causes the asset prices to go up, it causes the bond prices to go up and the yields to come down. So investors look at the bond markets and think, I can't get the yield over there. I'll go invest my money somewhere else. And that's the theory, that's the aim of, uh, of, 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 of printing money, of quantitative easing, is to get the money out of the banks, to get it out into the economy, effectively to create inflation. This is the equation for inflation, MV equals PQ. M is the supply of money, that's how much money is in the system, multiplied by the velocity, the speed at which it goes round, is a function of the price times the quantity of goods and services. Now for most economies, the V is pretty much fixed. If you think about it, that's the money that you receive and the money that you spend. It's pretty much constant, isn't it? So if you increase M, if there is more money in the system, and V stays constant, Q, well Q has to stay constant, okay, because we can't suddenly produce more Ferraris or more goods or services, so that is pretty much constant, and therefore the P goes up. So if you take money out of the system, it is deflationary, and P goes down. And if you put money into the system, then it is inflationary, and P goes up. Can I ask, why is the um, such a focus on ensuring that an economy grows 
year on year on year on year. And surely that's not sustainable. Because because governments want inflation. The target of the Bank of England is to create 2% inflation. And the reason it's 2% inflation is if you think about it, the government has lots of debt. How do you get rid of that debt? One way is to grow out of it. One way is to default, which isn't really an option. One way is austerity. You take a notch on your belt, and that's what is happening in Greece. Or you inflate your way out. But that's only if you believe in capitalism, because you, don't, you wouldn't have to be this way if this wasn't the way that our economy was designed. Absolutely. Growth isn't, this, isn't the only thing. Like, yeah. you, you know what I mean? Like, that's basically yeah. that's just the assumption that we have all accepted to Yeah, but it's when people talk about it, it's all as a fact. Yeah, you have exactly. to have growth, but it's, you know, you don't have to have growth. You don't have to have growth. But, but so okay. much of our economy depends on it, though. But what we're, what we're looking at here is, is, is and, and the, the, kind of the, the, the crux of this is that we need something to measure in. So if I said, you say to me, look, Ted, you've got, you've got an hour for this, 60 minutes. Now, your 60 minutes is my 60 minutes. And it's the same 60 minutes whether you go to um, Ireland, whether you go to uh, Africa, whether you go to New Zealand, whether you go to, you know, mm -hmm. they may not turn up on time, um, but it's still, you know, a minute is a minute is a minute. Mm -hmm. A second is a second is a second. It's the same the world over. So when we talk about currency, the whole time looking at currencies, things priced in pounds, and translating them into dollars. And when we go to America, we see things in dollars, and we translate them into pounds. Because I use pounds, and I'm living in, living in pounds, and I use pounds as my kind of basic, exactly, I'm earning in pounds, I'm thinking in pounds, I'm using that as my benchmark. Mm -hmm. This quantitative easing, this is messing with the benchmark. This is a bit like me saying, I'm in charge of the government, I'm going to give you an extra five minutes every day. Do you know that? You, know, you might have five minutes extra coffee in the morning, you might have five minutes extra with the kids in the evening, you might have five minutes extra over lunch. And if I did that every single year, for the first year you wouldn't really notice it, because every second becomes very slightly shorter. But after a while you would suddenly start to think, you know what Ted, those one hour meetings we have, they're just not quite long enough. We kind of need to have an hour and ten minute meetings. That's inflation. And Keynes said, by continuing a process of inflation, Governments can confiscate secretly and unobserved an important part of the wealth of their citizens. He went on to say, by this method, they not only confiscate, but they confiscate arbitrarily. And while the process impoverishes many, it actually enriches some. Those to whom the system bring windfalls become profiteers who are the object of the hatred. The process of wealth degenerates into a gamble and a lottery. He said, Lenin was certainly right. There is no subtler, no surer means of overturning the existing basis of society than to, than to debauch the currency, i.e. trash the currency. The process engages all of the hidden forces of economic law on the side of destruction, and it does it in a manner in which not one man in a million is able to diagnose. Okay? So the man out there doesn't understand what I'm talking about. They just don't get it, because it's done so subtly. And what happens is if you start to print money and you push it into the bond markets, you drive asset prices up and you drive yields down. And if yields go down, what happens to asset prices? They go up. Okay, it's cheap for you to buy to borrow money so you can borrow more money so the value of your house same house, but the house has gone up in value. So who benefits? Well, you do, but only if you own a house. Yeah. So the asset owners benefit. That's the wealthy. Who doesn't benefit? Who loses out? The people who don't own assets. The poor. So the rich become richer and the poor become poorer. And you start to end up with this wealth inequality. And as long as the American dream is alive, as long as you believe that perhaps one day you could own that house, you will carry on working. Mm -hmm. But at some point you go, I just, I'm never going to get there. They're too expensive. I just, I will never buy a house in London. That's where my kids are at the moment. They're going, I could never afford to buy a house in London. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you start to think about that, you start to take action. So if we go back to the 1980s, the 1980s, this is what it looked like with the America and the UK. Here's the 1990s. Here's 2000. And suddenly, we were facing the prospect of this. 
well, I don't know, we're never going to get that. So actually, we thought it'd be much more sensible to have something like this. But no, we didn't. We got that. So the US has voted for Trump. And Trump was talking about how electing Trump is a bit like that. What was Brexit all about? Getting control back. Getting control back, absolutely. So look at the leadership. Brexit, the actual vote was, was a, a, a campaigned by Cameron. He put it in the manifesto. The only reason he put it in the manifesto is he didn't think he was going to get control. He knew he was going to have to have a coalition government with the Lib Dems, and the Lib Dems would never have accepted the um, referendum, so he had to have something he didn't want in there so he could take it out as a bargaining tool. And then he got the power, and he had to follow it through. The opposition leader, complete waste of time, replaced by another weak opposition leader, the only other good opposition leader was Sturgeon. So when we go into the poll and we're faced with this, tick one of these boxes, it's do you want to remain part of the European Union or do you want to take control? Control of your borders, control of your laws, control over how you spend your money, control, control, control. And the reason that people who voted to leave is because they feel they've lost control. Now when you look at a map of the people and how they voted, Scotland, this is a heat map, so anything down here, anything with a dark red is a very, very remain, and anything with a dark blue is a very, very leave. And you can see that Scotland is a remain, and I think that's because of the strong leadership from the SNP, and London is a remain. And the reason London is a remain is that it's closest to the money. So the money that's being printed the people in London sit closest to, the banks benefit, the wealthy benefit, and the people who sit next to the wealthy benefit. But the people who are sitting out here, they don't benefit. They feel disaffected. They feel they've lost control. They don't understand why, but, they, but they, there's something that hasn't happened. And therefore, they just finally think, look, I've, I've, you know, there's a democratic process. I've got to vote to leave. So you can see here, London and Scotland vote to, vote to remain in Northern Ireland, and everybody else is like, I'm not interested, I've got to get out. And that's exactly what it, May has actually uh, articulated this in her, in her uh, uh, in the recent conference. And Trump, uh, you know, he, he wrote to, to, to power on a, on, a, on a populism vote, and I believe it's because of the quantitative easing by the banks. So the banks initiated quantitative easing as a response to the financial crisis of 2008, we continue, no, eight years later we are still in emergency measures with interest rates at rock bottom. Interest rates at rock bottom has pushed asset prices sky high and has created this massive wealth inequality. And we lot start to look across Europe and look at the Euro up and coming European elections, you know, if, if somebody doesn't do something about this, then we're going to see more Trumps and more populist votes. And more populist votes ultimately leads to the breakup of the European Union. And if you're going to break it up, you need to do it on an organ basis, like Article 50, because otherwise you end up with a disorganized basis, and then it all becomes a little bit messy. So, in conclusion, you might be sitting there thinking, well, hold on a sec, Ted, you know, when I walk out of here, the buses run on time, the trains are still on strike, you know, life goes on, everybody's doing what they should be doing. And the reason is, they don't understand this, they don't see the fabric, but they're starting to vote. And they're starting to vote with their feet, and they don't understand why they're voting, but they know, I, 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 I cannot have the, I don't want it as it is at the moment, it's got to change. And I don't know why it's got to change. And now you look at Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and watch the news, and, you know, there's lots and lots of, you know, people sort of, you know, articulating why Trump got voted. Trump got voted, from my perspective, Trump was voted in on the back of quantitative easing. It's a massive monetary experiment. It's never been done before. They are starting to mess with the fabric of society. Money sits at the heart and it glues us together. It allows the world to operate. And if you mess with that, you mess with the core fundamentals. I'm not saying that money is the, kind of, the whole money is root of evil aspect. I'm saying it, it allows us to trade. We don't think about money. You don't sit down and really have a think about what is that worth. Because if you print enough money, and if you print enough money and you cause people to lose faith in your money, you end up with banknotes that look like this. Remember the debt of the United States? 
19 trillion dollars. I have a bank note here that could repay the debt of the United States five times over. That is a 100 trillion dollar bill. This is a genuine currency issued by the Bank of Zimbabwe. That's what happens to your currency. So if you think this is all going horribly wrong, you need to prepare. And if you go to America, you'll find some people that call preppers. And the preppers are the people who are ready for the end of the world. There's a lot of people who believe that the end game has started. We've actually started that process of the end game. Who was the first prepper? Who was the first person who prepared for the end of the world? Amadeus. Before Amadeus. He was a prophet. Who? What? Jesus? <laughs> Jesus? Long before Jesus. Jesus didn't prepare Socrates. for the end of the world. What? Oh, Noah. Socrates. Socrates. Thank you Noah. very much. Noah. Noah. Built a boat on top of a top of a mountain. Yeah. I mean, even today you don't build boats on top of mountains. Imagine, back in the good old days, you're walking through the mountains, a little strong, you find this bloke, he's building a boat. What are you doing? He goes, I'm building a boat. He goes, what are you doing building a boat on top of a mountain? He's going to build a boat, build it next to the sea. He goes, ah. See, I know what's happening, I know what's coming. So if you feel like that, maybe you want to do your investments, you'll be investing shotguns, baked beans, gold, head for the hills, wait for them to come. Yeah. Unintended consequences. So it's quite interesting, I think, looking at so the, so the intended consequences, we print money, we print money to create inflation. We create inflation because we want the economy to grow, we want people to get jobs, we will remove the debt, everything goes on. But actually, there's knock-on effects. There's these knock-on effects of unintended consequences of printing money by central banks. And what's interesting about it is that people don't understand, people don't get it. They know something's wrong. They know that houses are unaffordable, they don't know why they're unaffordable. All they know is that I can't afford it and it's unfair. As soon as I think that I'm just never going to be able to afford my house, I've become part of generational rent. You know, at the end of the day, house price increases. People talk about getting wealthy. It's not wealth creation. It's wealth transfer. Because if I buy a house for fifty thousand and I sell it to you for a hundred thousand, I have to borrow fifty thousand to buy it. You have to borrow a hundred thousand. So my fifty thousand increase is your fifty thousand debt. So it's a wealth transfer from the younger generation to the older generation. And at some point, the younger generation go, this is not fair, I'm not happy with that. That's my little spiel. Thank you. <laughs> Quite depressing when you think about it, because you're right, we don't, you don't, you don't think about it on an everyday basis, necessarily. And this, is, you know, it's, and this is my pitch to you. So my pitch, my pitch you know, the reason I'm, you know, but the, you know, my pitch to you guys is that people don't understand this. And if you write textbooks, there's lots of books out there that explain this, but if you write a textbook, it sits in the business section. Mm -hmm. And it's only written by business people, and quite often it's written by business people who want to read what they want to hear. And I think that there's a message in here that people don't understand, but you can get them to understand. And you get them to understand through the medium of, I'll call it the Da Vinci Code medium. Mm -hmm. It's the engaging, you know, it's the thing which, you know, they can see it happening. Everything we've talked about is, oh yeah, no, hold on a sec. I, you know, I can start to join the dots, and, and you can help people to join the dots through a, through a yarn, through a story, through something which kind of, you know, you want people to be reading this book and go, I'm reading fiction, but this is, close to reality, just like people reading The Da Vinci Code and looking at Michelangelo's Last Supper again, oh, she really is a god, that is Mary Madeline, that isn't the, the, the other disciple. But, but, but the thing is that it does actually justify why people have voted the way they did, and they did it right, because they actually voted against the Absolutely. system, yeah, so they're, in a they're way, voting it isn't the really, you know, yeah. but, but the consequences are, you know, at the end of the day, the consequences are, so put interest rates back to 5%. I'm a big fan. Interest rates back to 5%. Because Jan Janet's keeping them low, and every time she goes into, every time they go into their conversations, they always... They have to. Okay, and if you think about it, okay, so, so, so let's play more joining the dots. So, you have a house. You have a house, you have a mortgage. You bought, borrowed your money from Lloyds Bank. Okay, so let's say you... And they put the interest rates up. If you put it, so, so you borrowed your money from Lloyds Bank, so they have a million pound loan, Okay, which is their asset, which is your debt, 
and your house sits as collateral behind that loan. Mm. So if they put interest rates up, your house now comes down in value. So first of all, you're not very happy with that. So you don't vote for the, don't vote for the government. The second thing is that as your house comes down in value, the loan on the balance sheet stays the same. What mm. changes is the risk because the collateral that secures the loan is now much lower. Who owns the bank? The government. So if the government put interest rates up and house prices come down, then all the banks, the RBS and the LBGs, will all become insolvent again. And the government will have to go back and, and, and bail them out again. And they haven't got any money to do that. But will they have to go back? Because there is that question about whether or not the banks were really too big to fail and actually perhaps they ought to have failed. Okay, can you imagine a central, a commercial bank like RBS failing in this country? What would happen? We would go backwards at least 100 years because everybody would just take their money straight out of the banking system. And because, um, and because of the, the H, B, C, T, D, drag and the... Well, it's not only that, it's not only the fractal reserving, it's not the fact that you take your money out of the bank, but so you have, so your money in the bank, Vodafone, to say, take an example, they use the monetary system to stay alive, just like you use your bank. You know, you have money paid in and money paid out, direct debits and so on and so forth. Vodafone does exactly the same thing. You close the banks. Vodafone goes, well, I can't pay my staff. And if you can't pay your staff, then Vodafone closes. And if Vodafone closes, you can't get Facebook. Yeah. And, yeah. and suddenly, everything just... I'll give you another example. 15th of September, Lehman Brothers goes bust. Mm -hmm. Okay, what we're trying to do is to try to trying to remove moral hazard. Mm -hmm. Moral hazard says the banks can make the bets. If they go wrong, they get bailed out. And if they go right, they bank the bonuses. Mm -hmm. So let Lehman Brothers go bust. It is an investment yeah. bank, not a commercial bank. Yeah. Let Lehman go bust, and you send a message to the market. The mm -hmm. very next day, AIG goes bust. Mm -hmm. Because AIG wrote $440 billion worth of credit default swap, which is the form of insurance on these uh, subprime mortgage products. Mm -hmm. If AIG had gone bust, 90% of the world's aircraft would not have taken off. Because AIG is an insurance company and it insures everything. Mm -hmm. And if you own an airline, you will not fly with that insurance because mm -hmm. you just can't afford to. Sure. Now, airlines, shipping, uh, can, you can you imagine, you know, you close this office because you go, I think we might be insured with AIG and we can't afford to have staff coming in here if we don't have insurance. Sure. So the whole world seizes. So from a commercial bank, they were right to bail out the commercial banks because they had to bail out the commercial banks. But what they haven't done is effectively turn the commercial banks into really safe, boring places like Nationwide where they take umbrellas to work in the summer because they're kind of so conservative, which is what you want from your commercial bank. You don't want people making money out of PPI and all this kind of stuff. You want banks who just sit there, take the deposits in, lend the money out, and they make real sure that they lend to the right people and they're going to get the money back. Mm -hmm. And they just err on the side of caution. That's what commercial, that's the role of commercial banks at the heart of our economy. But they turned into these massive gambling machines. And the thing is, if they, if they, if they reduce the banking sector, mm -hmm. it's deflationary. They don't want to create deflation. They've got to create inflation to get rid of all that debt. Right now, we have more debt than we've ever had before. Yeah. And you start to think, your point about growth, sorry, just, so your, your thing about growth, for example, so in 1971, Nixon dealings from the gold standard. Now, I, you know, I, I'm old enough to remember an advert, and do you remember Access? Do you remember the adverts of Access? They were, they were a long time ago. Access and money go shopping. And access is your flexible friend. And money is like, oh, I'm really tired of access because come on, money, we can keep going. Just put it on your access card, which is the precursor to the visa card. And we start to become used to debt. And we buy cars on debt. You walk into any car park in this country, I will guarantee you there's more debt in that car park than equity. But, but there also seems to be a change there in the way that people are thinking. So, um, from what I understand, I'm going to be wrong, but um, people are moving away from material material things into having simpler... Have you been to Dubai? Sizes? Dubai, improve your world by having material things, by buying mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. People are in debt because they're buying stuff mm -hmm. that they don't need. I think the opposite. I think people are moving towards materialism. So? Mm -hmm. But I think, but I think the key generations. is that, that we, are, we are much more familiar with debt. Our parents' mm -hmm. generation, mm -hmm. you know, the post-war generation, you save up and then you buy. 
You walk into any car showroom, they'll sell you a car on credit. You drive out, it's worth half the value you paid for it, but you've still got all the debt to pay. And you buy that, I've been across the garage and said, buy this shiny car, don't pay anything till next year. DFS, you buy sofas, you don't have to pay anything for five years. This is nuts. Buying a sofa on 0%, if you can't afford a sofa, get one second hand. Or get it off the dump, for example, or sit on the floor. Save up, then buy. We, you know, we have more today, we have more debt than we've ever had before. In 2008, it was caused by debt. Today, we've got even more debt. Why have we got more debt? Because interest rates are so low. Everybody's just filling up, you know, they're up to their eyeballs with debt. And what's really interesting is that if you look at it from a corporate point of view, the more debt you have, the more interest you have, the more interest you have, the less profit you make, and therefore the less tax you pay. So well, the world's problems, the world's problems are caused by drug and debt. Drugs are illegal and debt is tax deductible. <laughs> So anyway, that's my kind of that's my that's my take on it. Uh -huh. Thank you. <laughs> I've got one other question. Yeah, go. On. Just um, so there is the, the, there's a rise in car funding um, and also micro lending, so um, things like uh, funding circle and mm -hmm. other type of organisations. Kiva, yeah, that's, well, but that's more for. Crowd um, yeah, funding right. circle as a as an investor, I can make a range of concern on that. So, so do you think that that's going to become more commonplace? I think crowdfunding is just a function of technology. So but funding circle though, um, and companies or organisations like that where there's more peer-to-peer -peer lending? I think it's, it's, not, it's not really that big. You know, it, it's, it's not game-changing. You know, the bond markets are seventy trillion dollars. I mean, you, you know, crowdfunding is is is. You know, I, I think you know, peer to peer lending. This is all social media. This is technology. This is the ability for us to work. I mean, I think what is quite interesting is that the internet. If you look at what the internet does, the internet says you can sit anywhere you want. You can sit on an island and you're hooked into the whole world. Mm -hmm. Yet cities get bigger. Everybody's coming together. Everybody still goes to work. You know, we come together here. Why, why not do this as a webinar? because you can't beat that kind of that social interaction. So I think anything which allows social interaction, because we are social animals, you know, anything which allows that will, will, will benefit. But I think I think peer-to-peer -peer lending is just the technology allowing a new route to market for people who want to raise money. So if I go to the bank and say, I've got a great idea, and they say, sling your hook, I can go to a crowdfunding site and say, you get a free t-shirt if you want funding. So do you think things like Kiva and Finding Circle and all that kind of stuff in future years could end up replacing banks. Now they're small, they're, they're still so small. Oh yeah, I mean, bank, bank, you, can, you can replace banks. I mean, if you think about, um, if you go to uh, places in Africa, um, you know, there, there, are, there are people who just go, you know, they'll, they'll swap phone credits. So mm -hmm. I'll buy that book from you for five phone credits. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, what's really interesting, I think, is when you start to look at, so you kind of think about the, the, the move of technology, it's less about the kind of the peer-to-peer -peer lending, it's what they're lending. Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency. I think is really interesting because Bitcoin isn't owned by a central bank. Mm -hmm. So they can't print more of it. Mm -hmm. So it stays constant. Now, Except you, you have no control whatsoever about whether you'll get it or not. The moment everything is digital, for example, someone could, when you don't have anything that, you know, you don't have that cash, but you have Bitcoin. What if but you got cash? You go to Sweden, they're getting rid of cash. The yeah, central the, bank right. here wants to get rid of cash. They want to have yeah. it all in numbers in your bank account. Yeah. You want to hope you don't bank with Tesco because they're going to get hacked and they're just going to close it down. The bank, the central bank wants to get rid of cash. Yeah. Cash is expensive and if they control your cash, what they can do is they can charge you to hold money in the bank. And if there's no cash, you can't take the money out of the bank, so you yeah. have to spend it and that creates inflation. So this gives control to the central banks. I'm investing in Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin is, is, you know, is a potential. This is blockchain technology. This is peer-to-peer. -peer. But what it, if at some point the person, let's say, or people controlling Bitcoin say... Nobody controls well, it. But, hang Who on. controls the web? But, 
if you, if you say no one, then I think that's but quite... People can attack the way they take it down. Yeah. Yeah, they can, but nobody, nobody controls yeah. Bitcoin. It's blockchain technology. Okay. I'm not saying that you can, you know, people have had, you know, accounts hacked and, and yeah. you know, Mt. Gox went bust and so on and so forth. Okay, but but the point is that you know when you buy that, you say, well, this is all right. I've got the I've got the government of the United States. I've got this massive country. I've got you know I've got a big institution. I therefore I trust it. I'm not going to accept this tape because I don't know who I can pass it on to. But as more and more people start to take it on, yeah. as more and more people, you start to get, you know what? Actually, I'm pretty happy with that. As Jimmy, I was in uh, to, uh, Munich yesterday, and I'm in uh, Saudi Arabia tomorrow. Uh, not tomorrow, next week. Okay, they're going to pay me in different currencies. Just pay them in bitcoins. Just keep it one one currency. Just make it in bitcoins. 